<laughs> These are your notes here, Anthony. They are. You can use them if you want. I know. <laughs> I, 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 we did our half-year results um, in July, and we, uh, we did them at uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch at their massive conference center. And we did all the preparation and rehearsals the day before. <laughs> and then we turned up, and I got up on the podium, and I looked down, and they weren't my notes. They were actually the notes for another company. <laughs> um, uh, so I said to the assembled uh, analyst investors, I said, actually, a previous chief executive has left his notes. And reading them, I think they're better numbers than ours. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll leave you yours. It's very good to be here. Um, and uh, I was thinking about what my definition of leadership might be if I was sitting in the room uh, as you were and thinking about it. And I, I, I don't think leadership is a... Uh, an obscure thing, I think it's a very practical thing. Um, I also don't, for the record, think it's a very hierarchical thing. I used to, actually, when I was a lot younger than I am now. I used to think it was a very hier hierarchical thing because when you're more junior, you kind of assume it is. But actually, I've now developed a very clear view that actually leadership is a complementary thing. In other words, th this is going to sound extraordinarily immodest, for which I apologize, but I, I happen to believe, and it's probably a good thing that I do, that I'm pretty well qualified to do the job that I'm doing. But interestingly, I don't think I'm very well qualified to do most of the jobs you're doing. Um, and that's essentially what I mean by it's a complementary activity. Leadership is a role. It's a function. There are things I have to do in my job, and there are things that each of you have to do in your jobs. And if you get that complementarity right, actually, the net sum is greater. And the same will be equally true in your own teams and in your own roles. And I think that is a change in the way in which leadership has evolved over time. I think effective leadership starts from the principle of collaboration rather than command and control. I think sustainable leadership is underpinned by a basic sense of common ownership and really inspirational leadership that is sustainable over time has some fundamental generosity attached to it. And how you think about those things, how you create complementarity in your teams, how you create a sense of common ownership, and how you underpin it with a sense of long-term <coughs> generosity and contribution is one of the things that I think it's worth thinking a little bit about. Um, somebody once said that experience is the thing that allows you to recognize when you're making a mistake that you've made before. Um, and we all make mistakes. Um, first time I was ever given a job of running a business, a small business, the end of pretty much my first week, my then boss said to me, how did it go? I said, God, it was terrible. Terrible week, I said, and I sort of read out the litany of things that had gone wrong. He said, listen, just relax. He said, in any given week, if you're doing five and a half things right and four and a half things wrong, that's a good week. Um, so one of the things of leadership is it doesn't really matter. It's probably not a good idea if you're consistently doing five and a half things wrong and four and a half things right. But making mistakes and learning as you go will over time build an experience bank that will be, I think, extremely uh, helpful for, for all of you. Anthony. Thank you very much indeed for that. So we're running a little bit tight on time, so we'll make the interview component quite quick because we know we want to get your questions in. So, uh, but just to start with, Stephen, just to get to know the guest personally a little bit more, we normally start with what we call a quick fire round. So quick questions, quick answers. Uh, you are the CEO of JWT, NTL, Ofcom, Brunswick, and Alcatel. Uh, which ones do you find most rewarding? Uh, cliche answer, all of them. Okay. Um, I mean, they were very different jobs at very different times of my life. And your favorite holiday destination? Uh, anywhere that speaks French. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Mauritius, is it? No. Well, Mauritius does speak French, yeah. Um, when you were president of Alcatel, did you um, ever sponsor any of Ian's telecom conferences? And if not, can you pull some strings now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we did. I don't know if we sponsored any. We did. We definitely participated. In fact, I, I, I tell you, I do know this because when I went on the board of Informa, I had, to, I had to disclose what the, in the jargon is called a related party transaction. And we were, I think Alcatel was spending about three to four million 
euros a year with Informa, not just with Ian, but also in, uh, uh, in business intelligence, or actually that was Ian's business then at the time too. So. But I don't think we ever headline sponsored them. Did we ever headline sponsor a conference? Broadband One Forum. Yeah, probably Broadband One Forum, yeah. Um, and finally, uh, a little bit more of a serious one. An email came in this morning from a colleague saying, have you ever played table tennis on the new Inform HQ table? Oh, many times. <laughs> have you? Excellent. Yeah. Good, that was that out the way. Um, so if we can just start with individual success characteristics, so sort of what makes the individual from a self-leadership perspective uh, fly. In 1986, you became a uh, graduate on JWT. It was an experiment for JWT at the time because they normally only hired from Oxbridge, as you know. Um, boy, did that experiment pay off because eight years later, you became the CEO of the group at the tender age of 30 in 1994. So what, what are some of the attributes that you had that enabled you to get so fast, so high, so quickly? <laughs> I got lucky. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, that was a long time ago, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, but broadly, I got lucky, okay. I would say. For the hard you work, the lucky you get, you're known as a... Look, uh, I mean, yeah, sure, but everybody works hard. Okay. Um, Look, let me tell you, um, if I can, what the Telegraph thought. <laughs> um, the Telegraph said... Um, uh, this right, management today said pragmatism and speed of decision making were Carter's trademarks in his rise, rapid rise up JWT. I mean, you are known as a decision maker, a quick decision maker. Gordon Brown, when you came in as chief of staff for him, he was a known ditherer. You know, what is your, <laughs> what, what advice would you give to us, knowing that we are the sum of the decisions that we've made to life to date, on fast decision making, right decision making, sometimes under fire? You should do this for a living, you're good. Uh, um, somebody once said that the freedom of the media is generally only afforded to those who own them. Um, and so I learned long ago never to believe a word I read in the newspapers. Uh, uh, not that I'm disrespectful yeah. to the media, but uh, the, the media normally are, are trying to make a point. I, I, I certainly, just for the record, would not characterize uh, Gordon Brown as a ditherer, um, although I, I was well aware of the fact that's the way some people did. But to answer your direct question, I, I definitely do believe in the kind of uh, the principle of a good decision on Monday rather than the perfect decision on Friday. Right. Um, I think it's definitely true that it's ironically easier to... Um, purposefully follow and execute an average decision well um, than it is to live with an absent decision. <laughs> um, and so I, I think I am by instinct pragmatic. But if you ask me how I make decisions, and there are enough people here who now work with me close enough, closely enough here for the last couple of years, I rarely make decisions on my own. Yeah. I, I am a collective decision maker, which doesn't mean I'm a consensus decision maker, but I'm a collective decision maker. I, I, I rarely you know, sit in a, a darkened room with a towel over my head and come up with the answer. But um, I find that you put a, a group of people, and going back to some of the things I was talking about from the podium, who have a genuine sense of complementary skills, collaboration, a common ownership of what the goal is, underpinned by a level of generosity. Now, what do I mean by generosity? What I mean is, they're not making decisions solely on the basis of what's in it for them, or their team, or their business, or their success. And that's a, that, if you can create that environment, you can create very powerful teams, mm. very powerful teams. Because you're, you're consistently, and on a compound basis, sacrificing the short-term hit for the long-term gain. And, and that, I think, ultimately proves to be valuable. Now, you have to make sure you've got the right counterparties um, because, uh, you know, sometimes you're sitting across the table from other people who just don't want to play that game. Yeah. Um, so you've got to be able to spot them. Um, and that's another thing. You've got to be able to spot the reality of the person sitting on the other side of the table. Not what they say, but what they are actually going to do. Right, exactly. Somebody in the room has to make the decision even if there's a lot of conflicting arguments. In it. And one of the things I hear about you is that you allow a generous amount of debate, but the one person in the room has to make the decision. That's the leader. So sometimes, even if it's an unpopular decision, you have to have the courage to be able to go forth and use your judgment. Yeah, I think that's true. How much time have we got? Um, we've got about another seven minutes of the interview, then we're going to open up the floor, okay. if that's okay with you. Um, so we'll 
I'll take, I'll take the hint. I'll go on to the next question. Um, <laughs> getting back to leadership, what, what is the um, best piece of leadership advice you've ever received? The best piece of leadership advice I've ever received? Um, uh, don't do a job that requires you to be different in the job than you are as a person. Yeah. So in Integrity, authenticity. Well, ultimately, in leadership, more than a functional role, you have to be yourself. Yeah. Because to go back to your point about making decisions, decisions, they're not reflex actions, but they're ultimately a product of how you process data analysis, a set of circumstances, and then you apply yourself and your own thinking process to them. So if you're not comfortable with yourself in that job, you, you're, you're, you're constantly distorted. So you have mm. to be doing something where... You're, 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 you're playing, it's a bit like a sport. Um, you know, I'm a very average tennis player. Um, and so, and one of the examples of that is, I always run around the ball to hit a forehand, because I hit a reasonable forehand, but my backhands are terrible. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, decision making is like stroke play. You know when you're making good stroke play. You know when you're making good decisions. And a lot of that is about being yourself. So, I, I think, trying to find a role and a job and an environment and a group of colleagues and a business and a sector <clears throat> in which you can be comfortable being yourself will materially enhance your ability to be an effective leader. Yeah, because well, so many people try to put on a cloak or personality cloak 100%. or something else. And just, you can spot that in authenticity. Um, Ronald Cohen um, wrote a, a book called Second Bounce of the Ball where he said, you know, you're making money in today's market, but the great leaders and CEOs and businesses align themselves to where the next ball is going to bounce. Um, so it's somewhat putting bets on the future. How do you anticipate future trends and how do you make sure you're aligning to build up an innovative business and culture to prepare yourself for that? Um, well, you try and meet as many. I mean, that maybe goes back to your previous question. You try and meet a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you try and listen um, and um, see what other people are doing and then you know, run it in your head as mm -hmm. to whether or not you know, they're doing things that you don't understand or you don't, you don't know, you can't see. Um, I think that is partly the job of, of, of management. Mm. You know, my, by definition, I'm held to account for how the business is doing today. But really, ultimately, the judgment will be how the business is doing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you have to constantly shift from you know, the day-to-day, -day, is it being mm. delivered? And uh, you know, do we have a tomorrow? And what, is that mm. tomorrow, what does that tomorrow look like? What you can't do, and I don't know whether Ronald says this in his book, what you can't do is you can't sacrifice the today and solely have the tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I think it was Rupert Murdoch who said, the long term is a series of short terms stitched together with something resembling a strategy. <laughs> um, and you know, there's some truth in that too. You have yeah. to deliver the short term. You have to see how that all racks up. But you do also have to have a view about what the long term, the long term might look like. And that's yeah. part of what I was trying to lay out when I was talking about the journey for our business. Yeah, so it's going up to that level and then down to the runway. Mm. Thank you, sir. Pleasure, Anthony. For the Good interview questions. component. Thank you very much. Um, so if we can now open up to the floor. First question, please. I'm Jean-Pierre. I work for Gap, but I previously worked for Eaton in the ITM business. So knowing and, and everyone understanding that CEOs have a kind of short lifespan at the top of the company, <laughs> so without wanting to kind of ruin your career. It's really. okay. It's been nice um, knowing you. I better go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting myself forward. Um, do you find that affects your, the way that you operate, and do you feel kind of compelled or pressured to achieve something in that short uh, time span and do you find it affects your decisions at all? Three years and two months. That's the average lifespan, shelf life of a FTSE 150 CEO. Um, and there are three or four in there who've been there for like 25, 30 years. So if you do the maths, um, I, I, I may well be leaving shortly. Um, it doesn't, I can, I, honestly, I can say this, it doesn't affect me at all. It really doesn't. Not at all. I'm not in a rush. And, uh, you know, when the board uh, approached me in the first instance to apply for the job, which is slightly unusual, it's slightly unusual to go from being a non-executive to being a chief executive. And it slightly puts you in a, I mean, not a compromised position, but it's an odd position because when you're a non-executive, you're partly there to hold the management to account. The minute the board opens the conversation that says, would you like to be the management, it slightly changes the roles. So you have to sort of slightly put yourself to one side. 
Um, but I knew enough to know, yeah, I knew enough to know what I was probably signing up for. But I made it very clear to the board that, you know, I was not going to, we weren't going to rush this. Because my view is people businesses, and Informer is 100% of people business. I mean, sure, we'll invest in technology, sure, we'll invest in data, but it's never going to be anything other than a people business. If you, anyone asks me what's your, our business, it's a people business. I run process businesses. I run contract businesses. Ours is neither of those. This is a people business. Um, one surefire way to muck it up is trying to do it too fast. Because people don't change like that. In, in contract businesses, you can close down divisions overnight and the revenue still flows. Because actually the revenue and the profit is associated to the contract, not to the people. That's not true in our business. So we have to do it at a measured pace. I don't know how long you've been following what I've been uh, uh, yaddering on about. Uh, but I said right at the very beginning, we would do the change program in this company in a very measured way. I'm very clear where we're going, let me be clear. But we're not going to rush it. And I'm not in any rush. And the board isn't in any rush for me to rush it either. And if you're running the GAP program, you will know, what have we said to investors? We've said to investors, you will get no additional returns from this company for three years. That's quite a long time. That's quite a long time. That's what I mean by we've given you time. Well, we've bought time from the external markets. If you look at our earnings production as a company, we say our earnings are marginal earnings growth every year for three years. Right? That, that's, not, that's not a rush. Now, the thing you have to protect against is what the analysts call interloper risk, which is, you know, that's my view, but over here, someone goes, well, that's all very well. You can take as much time as you like. But meantime, this company is worth £100 today. It should easily be worth £150, either as a breakup or as a sum of the parts. So whilst you're taking your merry time, I'll come in and I'll steal the company or bits of the company from underneath you. So one of the things I'm constantly trying to manage against is what they call interloper risk, which is why we're trying to drive value into the equity so that it makes it much more difficult for someone to come in and poach the company from under us whilst we're repairing it. And actually, so far, we're doing a pretty reasonable job of that. Two years ago, our 52-week trading average as a company was £3.80. By the end of this year, I predict our 52-week trading average will be in the high £5. So we are in a position whereby we're not rushing. We've laid out a program. We said we're going to take time. We've told people what we're going to do. And that has given us some credibility, which has given us some protection in the equity. Mark Fluke, uh, Head of Sales for PVD and Global Finance. We've uh, got the pleasure of you here today, and we've had an inspirational speaker yesterday, for, all talking about leadership. Where do you take your, le your leadership from? If you need advice, where would you go? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm assuming when you said you had an inspirational presentation yesterday, you were talking about Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking here. Um, uh, where do I take my advice from? Well, actually, if you want me to be, I'll be really honest, I have a coach who I've worked with for now nearly 14 years, um, who some people have met, um, who I use as a kind of, you know, on a random basis, you know, for... You know, this is worrying me. I'm not sure about this. I'm a, you know, I think I got this wrong or I got this more right than wrong. And so he has a lot of, uh, he's not British, he's Malaysian actually. Um, and he has a lot of uh, sort of history therefore. So he kind of knows uh, enough, enough, about, um, enough about me as a leader to be able to give me good advice. So I'm quite a big believer in coaching um, um, and development. Um, I use our chairman a lot, Derek. He's very supportive. I speak to Derek at length once a fortnight. And rarely a couple of days will go by where we won't exchange on something by email or by phone. Um, I use the executive team um, quite a bit, either individually or collectively. And, and this sounds like a sort of yawning cliche, so I'm almost in, you know, resisting saying it. But you know, I probably... In the final analysis, I, 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 would, I would say my wife, actually, um, on the grounds that, to go back to the point about authenticity and leadership, I don't know about you, but um, you know, the place where you're probably most yourself is when you're at home, um, and therefore that's the place where it's easiest to say, look, this is what's 
this is really what I'm not sure about. Um, and you, you can literally and metaphorically be, you know, sort of uh, most, ex most exposed. And when you're making decisions which involve people, which they often do, or resources, or risk, um, which is ultimately what leadership is about in all of its, in all of its manifestations, um, it's handy to be able to, you know, to talk to someone who isn't going to judge you. So you're always trying to find people who don't judge you. I read a lot. Um, as people who've worked with me for a long time will know, I'm a big believer in learning. I, I think you have to be, if you want to be a leader, you have to be curious. Um, you really have to be curious. Um, because if not, you're, all you're really doing is recycling your own history. And I've had an interesting history, but it has a half-life. We, we there was one more question just over here. Someone had to hand up. We can send that clip to your wife if you'd like. I think she'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Stephen. It's Hi, Marvel. Marvel. How are you? I'm well. Good. Um, if you created an emerging or sort of future leaders initiative for the leaders of tomorrow, could you tell us a little bit about what that would look like? The answer to that would be, what have I derived the richest experiences from as a business leader? Which I, I, maybe it's where you're going. I don't know. And I have derived the richest experiences as a business leader when I've been put in positions where I have been most at sea. Um, I, I don't mean by that at sea in the kind of, hell, I have no idea what I'm going to do and it's all going to go wrong and my life is going to end. I don't mean that sort of at sea, although I've had a bit of that along the way. Um, but I mean, when I've been put in positions or circumstances where I've re it's really been an alien set of circumstances. Um, and so I don't know how each of you to go back to the question that I just got asked, I, I don't know how each of you do your own learning, your own development, your own stretch, but our business is very busy. We demand a lot of our people, I think. Um, I think we have a nice working environment, but I think we demand a lot of our people. And I wonder if we create enough time and space for people to be able to step completely outside of what they do and put themselves in such a, a, a different set of circumstances that they've got time to, to learn from that and then bring it back to the day-to-day. -day. On the rare occasions when I've, I've done that, I've done it maybe three times, it, it's been really fantastically useful. Um, and I don't know, maybe when we steady the business and we're on the track to growth, maybe that's something we could consider doing. Um, I mean, you know Lindsay Levin, I know. I did a great thing with Lindsay. Lindsay Levin is a, a, a mutual friend of Marvelous and ours. And she set up this amazing lady, and she set up a not-for-profit business called Leaders Quest, and probably about 15 years ago, I think. And, um, uh, and Lindsay, essentially her idea was, how do you take leaders from different walks of life, bring them together, and put them in a situation or circumstance which they would never normally experience? <coughs> and, and, and I spent two weeks with her in, in sort of urban and remote China in 2003 or four. And it was an incredible, it was an eye-opening experience for me. It was really quite transforming. So I think those sorts of, a challenging set of circumstances with a group of people who are doing things that really are tough, um, I think is, is very humbling and a very good way to learn. Guys, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. But if we could, um, Stephen didn't actually know that we were going to be doing it in this format until I spoke to him on Tuesday morning, as he said. And I just love the fact that he's just chucked himself at it the way he has. So a massive personal thank you to me. And if we can just all say a massive round of applause to Stephen. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Stephen.